That's Max. I'm Andy. I'm Amy. And today we're going to talk about, well, Max maybe isn't going to talk yeah, about Yeah, he's not so wordy today. We're going to have a nice discussion about art and um, life. Disability in the arts. Access to the arts for people with disabilities. And who knows what we might get to. You might be scared what we might get into. Max is speechless. <laughs> so. Coloradans, I'm very proud of that. So <laughs> I like to remind people of that whenever I can. Um, but I was born and raised in Denver and then left for college. Went to University of Puget Sound out in Tacoma. And then went to grad school in Boston. Back to Denver for a bit and got a job in Indiana. And Majoring in what in, in, at the college level? French uh, literature. Okay. I originally I started out as a foreign language international affairs major, and I, that's a mouthful. Yeah, I really wanted to be a spy, <laughs> but it's you know, you can't major in spying. So I okay. thought, well, foreign language international affairs. A lot of people who start out in international affairs end up in law, but I really wanted to do diplomacy, and so that was kind of that major was designed for people who wanted to do diplomacy. And I also thought that if I were a spy, no one would know. I mean, nobody's going to suspect. But then um, I took my first literature class in French, and it was over. It's like, that's it. And that's done. Where it came. Yeah. Okay. But I was obsessed with French for a really long time. Um, ever since I started taking it in eighth grade, I was obsessed. Um, but I was really into music. I'm still into music, but I was very into the clarinet and I was going to be a musician. That's what I wanted to do. And um, so I wanted, you know, I had dreams of going to the Paris Conservatory and I used to paint like Bob Ross style. <laughs> Oh, wow. Happy trees. You know, my grandpa taught me to do oil painting. And There's talk. a place for that kind of there thing. There is. There is. And, and it was very therapeutic. And so Absolutely. I used to sign all my paintings. <laughs> Instead of Amy, I, I made it the French way. I was Amy. That was my, just no last name. Just Amy. Yeah. Of yeah. All my happy trees were mm -hmm. Amy. Except in less of tree. I did lots of mountain scenery because it's mm -hmm. the Colorado in me. But yeah, so I've always been very artsy. Um, I did win, actually, in eighth grade, no, sixth grade, um, district-wide art competition. For your painting? For, it was a multimedia okay. um, thing. It was um, a self-portrait, we were supposed to do a self-portrait, and I was, that's when I was very into the clarinet, and so I did this I, clarinet drawing, and then I put my self-portrait in it, and there was like a music and I don't remember exactly all what my parents have it somewhere but yeah I won the district in my category well that's fun yeah and then I got because of that I got a um a little scholarship for summer painting classes and that's where I learned beyond the Bob Ross I, <laughs> I actually okay. learned and then we did pottery so I've always really loved stuff you know doing things but I also learned early on that I in music, I did not have, I think, a musician's heart in the sense that I was, well, A, I need health insurance with a disability, so I need something a little more steady right. income-wise. So I picked, you know, teaching, ha, in, in college, not so stable, but whatever. Right. Um, because if there's one endeavor that this country really values, appreciates it's, it's, it's teaching. It's French literature. And, yeah, and specifically <laughs> French literature. Yes. So, yeah, so I was very... Um, but I think that gave me a, a love early on of and an appreciation for the arts, whether or not you go on. Whether to, or not you are physically creating the art or yeah. if you are consuming the art. Exactly. And I think, you know, participating in the arts as a young person is really important. My parents made sure that, you know, once we were, 
you know, I was much more drawn to that than my brother. My brother is more outdoorsy and, and they were very good at finding things that um, really drew out our passions and gave us an outlet. And so I think that's why, you know, my husband and I, Jeevan, are really passionate about education and the arts because even it, just because you're educating young people in the arts or the community in the arts doesn't mean that that student, in order for that program to be successful, that those students have to end up being professional musicians. I mean, those skills that I learned are skills that I take with me everywhere and, and that appreciation for classical music. And I was really into jazz. I did jazz clarinet for a while. My, my uh, private teacher was a jazz musician. So my reward for doing all my hard classical work was learning jazz theory. And, you know, so just those are things that I, always take with me. So, from this camera angle, from this camera perspective, people who are not familiar with you may not be able to tell, you've hinted at it a couple of times, that you, you live with a disability. I do. I was about to say suffer from a disability, but then <laughs> I felt that, 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 yeah, that that's a negative gonna, way of spinning exactly, it. Exactly. Yeah. But you are living, you yes. are existing with I'm a disability. Thriving. Right. Yes. Even better, right. Yes. You are not just exchanging oxygen for carbon dioxide. <laughs> that's true. So the term that a lot of people hear is little person. Yes. And But that's not necessarily an exclusive term from those similar to you right. may share. So right. you yourself may use the term. I use dwarf. Okay. Um, a lot of little people use the word dwarf. There's a, another sort of disability advocate who kind of explained it once that a lot of people in the community tend to use the, the word dwarf amongst themselves because it does make people uncomfortable. Okay. But then in, in kind of on the outside community, people use little person or LP. Um, the truth of the matter is... LP, I like yeah, that. Yeah, it's the end term. Um, <laughs> but dwarf, I mean, dwarfism is the medical condition. So let's take this. When we're talking about socially acceptable or unacceptable mm -hmm. terms from within that community mm -hmm. or from outside of that community, mm -hmm. um, I'm not comparing the two except to say that they're both of some minority, that if we were to take the, the N-word mm -hmm. from the African-American mm -hmm. community, would the M word? Yes. Is that kind of an equivalent? Yes. Okay. The M word, which is midget, if anyone wants to know, please do not say that word. Um, it's, she said it. I me. did, yeah. So, I was careful. Uh, um, yeah, that is, I haven't heard anyone use it to describe themselves really. Um, because I've talked to other activists who are like, why don't we reclaim that word? Or why haven't, hasn't your community reclaimed that word? Because I use the word crip a lot as sort of a, a self-reclaiming uh, sort of thing. And there are a lot of people in the disability community who use that. But it's, again, a word we can use, but no one outside the community should use it. I get that. Um, but I, I don't totally think there's a that. critical mass of people ready. We're not ready to claim, reclaim that word. And they're still, by and large... There are plenty of people who use the M word in a derogatory way, so I don't think it's ready to be, and there's not just not enough of us to, to really be ready for that yet. And, you know, P.T. Barnum is the one who really used that word okay. and developed that word to separate um, different types of people with dwarfism. So I would not have gotten the term midget because I'm not... Um, proportionate i'm a i have a short because. i have short limb dwarfism so my torso is more average but my limbs are and i'm deformed so i would be on the outside i would be in the freak show part See, and then this is, yeah this is where for for me so don't watch it, that movie i'm gonna look at you fourth wall now okay don't now, watch that movie. to without condoning but <laughs> to be a little i don't necessarily yeah. want to use the, the word fair but the context I mean, P.T. Barnum was, what, late 1800s, early 1900s? Yeah. Okay, so, I, again, I don't like to use the word fair when using it. Because that almost sounds like I'm trying to justify using uh -huh. a term or, or using a section, a sect of people right. in a way that's obviously maybe kind of messed up and wrong. So I think, though, the overall social awareness of the planet Right. Back 
140 years ago, 120 years ago, I would, I think it's safe to say is not what it is today. True. But, but does that excuse But he was behavior? definitely exploiting people with disabilities. And I think that's where movies like The Greatest Showman do a big disservice to the disability community and particularly the dwarf community because, you know, Tom Thumb and all those things. Um, because he not only, I mean, he was definitely exploited. I mean, he purchased people with disabilities oh and my. exploited them See, to become a wealthy man and developed terminology to separate socially acceptable disability from not socially acceptable. So the notion of a freak show is something that he capitalized on. And so within the disability community, if we talk about arts in the disability community, one of the big things that we really talk about is, you know, all of these films that glorify people with disabilities or things to do with disabilities aren't really getting our input. People, I have not met a person in the disability community who likes that movie. Um, okay. Because it completely erases that part of the history. Um, and, you know, he really, and I haven't seen the movie, but I've heard that the way he's portrayed is as a sort of savior of Tom Thumb, and that's not how it worked. Um, but, you know, even if you look at the Oscars, there's all this talk about, you know, last year was Oscars so white and about you know, how white the Oscars were and erasing all this black art, one of the talk in disabilities is that, you know, it, it, what about people with disabilities portraying people with disabilities? When people get Oscars, it's mo it's often for playing someone with a disability. Like that, you know, if you play, you know... Well, Eddie Redmayne won yeah, the I Best mean, Actor for playing Stephen Hawking. Yes, and, and, and that's another movie that sort of... Which doesn't treat seen. disability very well, and it doesn't tell the whole story. And I, I don't know what Stephen Hawking felt about that movie, but, um, you know, um, the what's the one that won all of these um, awards? Shape of Water. Yes, and you know, people are like, why did that not use deaf a deaf actress? And say, and now there's the other one, A Quiet Place, which actually oh, did so use. She the... actually is deaf, and the deaf community is completely in love with the fact that that happened. So really, there are plenty of actors with disabilities looking for work. So I think that's one of the things that people always talk about, like dwarfs in particular. Well, you know, I don't really, I'm not a fan of these reality shows with all of these little people, you know, little people, New York, little women, whatever. Right. And I don't begrudge anyone doing things for money because the really the truth of the matter is is that these are people who aren't given the opportunity to have meaningful work in Hollywood or in the industry, but um, it's perpetuating stereotypes of of how we are, and so I, I don't like that they exist. I wish that there were opportunities for people with disabilities in the arts so they didn't have to take these demeaning positions. I mean, Peter Dinklage in the Grand Game of Thrones is the exception. He is not the rule. We have to start letting people with disabilities create art and be part of that art. And I think that's why the show Speechless um, is such a big deal for the disability community. It's actually, you know, the main character has cerebral palsy, the artist has cerebral palsy, and significant cerebral palsy. We're not talking minor cerebral palsy like in Breaking Bad. I mean, we're talking significant um, speech difficulties in the show. He's nonverbal, and um, the main, the creator of the show, his, his, I think his son or something, has a similar disability or has that disability. And this season, they've hired someone with significant cerebral palsy to write for the show. It's, it shouldn't be that revolutionary. It's like somebody, you know, you know, because we, we talk about how revolutionary Blackish is. And I hope my hope is that speechless turns into that for people with disabilities. So this conversation is leading to a question that, that's been on my mind a lot in the last few weeks, last couple of months, where your point about the actress in The Shape of Water mm -hmm. played a hearing impaired person, but was in fact not real life hearing impaired. Right. Um, one of the taboos that we hear about in you never have a white person go in blackface right. for obvious reasons. But from an objective point of view, 
where does because an actor or an actress to me is not the same thing as are you a skilled carpenter whereas there are a specific set of you know build me a table right a person who kind of knows what they're doing will build you a crappy table a person who has years of experience and has training and education right. will build you a work of art right now they're both in a sense a table at the end of the process but which one but what did you pay for what did you order what did you commission them to make right. so when it comes to th that's the best way i can maybe well i mean if, if an actor or an actress is if you're casting a role should someone feel obligated just based on their if this character is written in such a way to have some sort of a disability well because okay so, so and i think that i know where you're going and i think that the question or the, the answer is there are plenty of qualified actors with disabilities looking for work and they aren't even getting them to the casting you know couch well that sounds different yeah, problem but couch, yeah. yeah um but you know to the casting call they're just and they're, i cannot remember the name of the movie but there was a movie and it was a child and they have a disability that ends up in a deformity of the face and they made a decision a newer to, movie or an older movie? a newer movie um not not the um not mask, mask no but similar to to. sort of um right. concept but there was a, a kid who actually auditioned for that role, who had that condition, everything, and instead they chose to go with an able-bodied six-year-old or whatever, it was, it was a young kid, eight-year-old, um, and chose to put hours and hours of makeup on this kid um, because the real disability was too unsightly. And that's the type of erasure that happens when you have, I mean, disability isn't, um, Hollywood, because it's using all these able-bodied actors, it tends to romanticize disability. Disability isn't suffering, but it's not always pretty. And I think that's what um, why it's really important to look at art made by people with disabilities, because um, when we're told time and time again that our bodies aren't beautiful, um, that art that can come out of reclaiming the body and all those sorts of things can be really interesting but i also think um you know and i i try to be really careful with the whole blackface conversation and and disability because there are some people in the disability community who um compare it to to blackface and and um you know in the trans community people call it trans face when people like um okay. you know are playing trans characters when there really are plenty of trans actors who are available like um in transparent um so I, I think that's a slippery slope. I don't want to compare too much to blackface just because the, the menstrual history is very different um, and, and dangerous, but I do think, you know, at least with the disability community, we do have the freak show history um, of being exploited. And I think that's where we really need to look for answers and more being in control of the way we're portrayed and the way society sees us because almost all of these these films about disability, you know, my left foot and um, the theory of everything and, you know, all of these films are really romanticizing disability and people are overcoming disability and they're such good attitudes and it really just reinforces people with disabilities that if you don't manage to do extraordinary things, it's your fault. Um, and there's, you know, a term in disability culture called inspiration porn that when when able-bodied people create these memes and these pieces about disability it's really to make themselves feel better about disability not it does not serve the disability community not and, so much about creating an inroad to the dis to the disabled community right. but is it almost like um just throwing throwing a few crumbs in that direction Right. I mean, it's tokenism and, so, and I don't want to be, I want to be, you know, cause you always hear people, you know, when Stephen Hawking died, he did all this stuff in spite of his disability and he was freed from his wheelchair. Finally, you get all these people who are like, Oh, now he's free. Um, you know, and a lot of people in the disability community were saying, well, he, the wheelchair always freed him. 
people in the disability community think of their mobility devices and their adaptive technology as free. You know, my service dog frees me. Um, he's a part of who I am. Um, and, you know, when I die, I will have less pain, but I also don't think my life is worthless with what I have now. And I think that's where, you know, all of this, this way that the able-bodied world has about framing disability makes the disability community um, question its value. The representation of people in, in of people with disabilities in the arts is abysmal. So, yeah, it bothers. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a problem. And I think, and that's the same thing when, when you know, white people are playing people of color. It's a, the opportunities just aren't there, and you're taking an opportunity from someone else. Um, so it's kind of like if you're going, if someone is going to the trouble to write a character and produce a, uh -huh. a film or a show uh -huh. with that character that is not of a white heterosexual male persuasion, right? Maybe the responsibility, maybe there is a larger responsibility. I think there, uh, yeah.